Hey, what's up, everybody? And welcome back to News Dose. And some good news hit the Nintendo Switch today. It's 2023's most anticipated game. This was actually the winner at the Game Awards, being Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. And yes, this game got a little bit of an update today. At the very least, I think this is a good sign for its release date. Hope. Hopefully, we'll, we'll talk about that today and I'll explain why. And then also in regards to the Activision Blizzard acquisition, because I, I guess that's just what we do anymore. We talk about this on a daily basis. And well, news does continue to churn on all of that. Of course, yesterday we talked about how gamers are ruling in favor of the acquisition. That is official results, by the way. But now here, the buyout is taking a completely unexpected bewildering and just flat out strange turn and that's because i guess a few gamers came together and decided they need to take the law into their own hands yeah microsoft is now facing another lawsuit but this time against gamers so we're gonna get into that today first though Let's just go and jump right into things, starting off with the PlayStation VR 2. It's hard to believe the PSVR 2 is right around the corner. In fact, it will be out in exactly two months from the making of this video. It will be out on February 22nd, but that there's kind of the thing. Sony, they haven't really shown too much on this device as of yet. Now, to be fair, they've shown a little bit here and there. They're just kind of trickling news out. But with its imminent release, I think you'd kind of expect its hype to ramp up a little bit more than what we've seen thus far. Well, the good news here is that might actually be happening relatively soon, as it's been spotted that their CES 2023 cover image displays the PlayStation VR 2 front and center. Which, I mean... That, that does make sense. Sony has frequently showcased their gaming products at CES, including, well, the PlayStation 5. So, no big surprise, they do the same with new technology like the PlayStation VR 2. Now, if you are interested in watching this yourself, though, I will leave a link in the description so you can check that out. But their CES presentation will go live on January 4th. As always, though, if something interesting does happen there, I, of course, will let you all know about it. That's why you're all subscribed, after all. If you're not, well, then maybe you should hit those buttons. Speaking of PlayStation VR 2, though, the box art for its physical games was also revealed. You can see a picture on screen here for The Walking Dead, Saints and Sinners, Retribution. And as you can see, it's, it's pretty much basically a PlayStation 5 box art, which, I mean, that makes sense, considering you have to also have a PlayStation 5 itself. So, I mean... It's kind of required. But then below that white headline, as I just said, it shows PlayStation VR 2 required. So I think it, it's handled rather well here. So hopefully, I mean, I, I know there's always a few people that, that don't read, but hopefully for the most part, this should cause little confusion. Next up, Nintendo is having yet another good day, and that really starts off with Triangle Strategy. We'll get more on a Nintendo here in a second, but this one is one of their key console exclusives for 2022. Keep in mind, it's also available on PC. And in fact, I believe it's actually at a discount today, so keep that in mind. But it was received very well by both fans and critics alike. It's easily, easily considered to be one of the better tactics style of games, especially when it comes to a new IP, really taking us back to those Final Fantasy tactics style of days. I, I know fans have wanted a revival of that franchise and everything, and while we've yet to get that, Square Enix did make a completely new IP here using that just gorgeous HD 2D art style. So I think fans of the genre has to be thrilled with Square Enix doing more with this genre. Hopefully we'll see more of that to come. And that right there is exactly why this update today is just so satisfying. Square Enix just announced that Triangle Strategy has eclipsed 1 million units sold worldwide. Now, that sounds like a success to me, and that, that's a good sign because with its success, it really does two different things. First, it shows Square Enix that there's reason to invest in the tactics RPG style of genre. I mean, to be fair, they've released other games like this as of recent. Tactics Over Reborn and Dio Field Chronicles both comes to mind here. But we are seeing when it comes to Triangle Strategy, they can have success with a completely new tactics-based IP. The other part, though, is that it's also yet more proof that those HD 2D games are a major, major winner for them. Really, if anything, Team Asano, which is the same studio behind Bravely Default, they've worked on, I believe, Live Alive HD, and now here with Triangle Strategy. I mean, yeah, they, they seem like they're quietly one of Square Enix's best studios right now. 
Now, in regards to Nintendo games, they did also announce four more independent games today as a part of their holiday event. We've been pretty much covering this all week long. And the first one here being Melantonin, which is a rhythm game with an attractive art style to it. Now, from what I gathered, it appears with this game, there's all kinds of different rhythm-based mini games. I actually think if you like this genre, I actually think it looks like a decent amount of fun. I think that if you if you like this genre, this one, it, it does at the very least seem interesting. With it always doing something new and different, plus, I mean, I, I really do like the art style. So I think it could be a fun game to run through. And much like a lot of their other announcements this week, the cool thing here is that, yes, it is available right now. So if you get any of those handy dandy eShop cards during the holiday, I mean, hey, why not? Just go and keep an eye on Melantonin. Next up here, though, and this game is a little bit more my style, or really a lot more. Uh, that being After Image, I am a big fan of the Metroidvania genre personally, and that's that's exactly what this game is, hence why it's a little bit more my style. It also does sport an attractive hand-drawn art style. I think this looks really good in motion. And this is their description of After Image. They say that each area features entirely different enemies and gameplay mechanics. Also, there are many unique bosses challenging your skills across the land. Opportunity lies in risks with hundreds of chests and numerous abilities ready to be unlocked to aid your adventure. Develop your very own combat style. A diverse selection of weapons with special attacks and various upgrade paths on the talent tree will help you improve yourself in this fast-paced action RPG. You will be the greatest warrior of the land. So, I mean, it, it really just kind of sounds like your typical Metroidvania, which, hey, I'm not complaining about that at all. Again, if you like this genre as I do, After Image might be worth keeping an eye on when it releases on April 25th. They then also announced Smile for Me, which is a point-and-click adventure game. This one has been available on Steam for quite some time, if anything. It does have overwhelmingly positive reviews on Steam. It honestly, though, sounds like this game is kind of bizarre and really an untraditional game. But at the same time, fans, they do seem to really enjoy it. I, I've heard it's got some good characters and just well-designed puzzles. Smile for Me, though, is heading over to the Switch, spring of 2023. Then, last but not least, Hyper Gunsport was announced, and this here is exactly, exactly why I like indie games. Independent games do have this tendency to have these really unique and creative ideas, and I, I think that's kind of what you're seeing here in Hyper Gunshot. It's a combination of gun battles with volleyball. I mean, I never would have thought about that myself, but it sounds it, it sounds fun. This game, though, does have solo mode. It's got a local cooperative mode, and it's also got versus. Now, I'm not entirely sure if it has online multiplayer or not. I hope it does, because I think that there is some potential there to have fun with this one online. But if anything, Hyper Gunshot looks like it can be a great party game. I mean... If you're looking for a fun game to play with your friends or family over the holiday, maybe check this one out. And you know that that's the better part here because, yes, it is available on the Nintendo eShop right now. So there you go. Nintendo continues to have a good overall week with their indie showcase. I'm still hoping we get some news tomorrow for Sports Story. I mean, I would love to see Hollow Knight Silk Song. Still not convinced it'll be there. But hey, we can have hope, right? All right, so let's go and talk about Activision Blizzard, though, as this bio just took a strange and, I mean, just surprising twist. Uh, so <laughs> what's happening here is that 10 gamers decided to come together to face off against the big bad Microsoft as they are suing them in the hopes to block this buyout. Honestly, I actually laughed when I first read this because it, it really just seems kind of silly, to be honest. I, I mean... Really, talk, talk about overstepping, as, as it almost seems like console wars just became real with the court involved in everything. Really, your, your media thought when reading this headline is that this is a case built around protecting somebody's favorite or preferred platform. L let's just go and be honest about it. That That's what your media thought is, right? And really, that's, that's probably a large part of this case. More on that in just a second. But in an almost ironic way, I have seen some people say that this new case here is just as well put together as the FTC's case as it brings up some points that they haven't. You know, it, it's almost like gamers know a little bit more about the game industry than these regulators that are trying to make a political point. Who would have thought, right? Now, at the same time, though, I, I'm not going to sit here and say that this new case from these quote-unquote gamers have much merit to it. Far from that, actually. 
but we're still going to go over it today and why they're claiming to do this. So first thing first, because I know it's on everybody's mind here, the 10 plaintiffs, eight of them, yes, prefer to play on PlayStation, with some of them only playing on PlayStation. So that that kind of adds to the story being a little bit on the silly side of things and maybe just a little bit disingenuous. But nonetheless, this is what they had to say. If Microsoft's proposed acquisition of Activision Blizzard is allowed to proceed, the video game industry may lose substantial competition, and Microsoft may have far outsized market power with the ability to foreclose rivals, limit output, reduce consumers' choice, raise prices, and further inhibit competition. This is actually very similar to what we've seen from regulators and actually Sony as well. but. There are some other things that they did bring up as well. With that said, I was reading through some of their complaints as this is made public. I'll actually drop a link in the description. But I mean, some of these complaints, I mean, they seem beyond skewed and just manipulated to the point. Microsoft, they're going to quickly blow up these arguments. Just as an example here, they tried to claim that the Xbox series has sold nearly as much as the PlayStation 5 this generation, which... That's just not true. I mean, yes, on one side, the Xbox series is doing better than the Xbox One, no doubt about that, but the PlayStation 5 still has a marginally comfortable lead worldwide. Now, if we just focus on the United States, yes, Xbox is a little bit more competitive, but worldwide, that's a little bit of a different story. These are the arguments that I'm talking about when saying they're being a little bit misleading. They also talked about Xbox Game Pass having 60% of the subscription market, but as we've talked about a hundred times already, PlayStation hasn't really tried to compete in that category until just very recently with PlayStation Plus Extra. And even then, they still take a completely different strategy than Xbox. They focus on $70 retail games. They do not put their games into the service day one. If they want to grow their subscription service, then maybe they need to put a little bit more effort into it, which they don't. So again, I'm sure Microsoft, they're going to bring that up. Actually, in fact, they have brought that up in the past. Now they also, and, and this is the one that really gets to me. They also try to rehash the Nintendo argument that they aren't true competitors to Xbox, which I think that that debate is just absolutely ridiculous. Nintendo absolutely competes with PlayStation and Xbox. They always have. Yes, they have a little bit more of a foothold when it comes to those family-driven titles, but that's just their strategy. They still have mature-rated games. They, they just do. In fact, Microsoft, they're trying to put Call of Duty on Nintendo. It, Yeah, these arguments are the ones I'm talking about. I, I don't think does this case much favor. To me, it really just sounds like they're throwing anything that they can against the wall that we pretty much already heard in the hopes that something will stick. Now, with all that said, they did bring up some other points that we haven't really seen from these regulators. They do focus a little bit more on all of Activision Blizzard's IP rather than just focusing on Call of Duty. They did point out that they have a lot of studios with a lot of beloved IP. So to them, they're basically saying, hey, for gamers, it's not just about Call of Duty. And you need to also consider games like Spyro, Crash Bandicoot, Hexen, Tony Hawk, games like that. Will those be exclusive on Xbox? They're, they're kind of talking about that. So really, regulators, they haven't focused on that aspect. And that's one thing that does kind of differ here. Though, there might actually be a reason for that. I think that the reason why regulators and Sony have focused so hard on Call of Duty is because that's the one IP that could actually have a major impact on competition. It is their best opportunity to stop this acquisition. Whereas these other IP, they're just... They're not as mainstream. In other words, it would be more difficult for them to argue in court that something like Spyro and Crash Bandicoot could impair competition. I mean, yes, I like these games more than I like Call of Duty, but at the same time, Call of Duty, that's quite literally the most popular game, one of the most popular games on a yearly basis. Making that exclusive could, yes, theoretically shift millions up on millions of gamers over to Xbox. Now, as we all know, Microsoft is keeping it multi-platform anyway, so that point is kind of moot. But nonetheless, that's where we kind of are now. These gamers are trying to sue Microsoft. I don't know. I, I think it's silly, to be frank. And I, I don't want to paint this up like they have some brilliant insight because reading through some of these complaints, 
I don't think that they do. Sure, they make some different points, but it almost seems like a case made out of bad faith. I mean, that that's just how I kind of look at this. Maybe they want the extra PR to strengthen the case for the regulators, or maybe they're hoping Microsoft just tries to settle with them to shut them up. I wouldn't put that past anybody because there are people out there like that. I'm not saying that the situation here, I don't know these people. So I can't say that for an absolute fact, but I mean, all I'm trying to say is that you never really know when it comes to people anymore. And I, I think that that's just the sad truth here. Then, I mean, with some of these arguments like Nintendo is more family driven, that's why they're not a true competitor. Well, they say that on one side and then on the other side of things, they're all kind of like, well, Spyro and Crash Bandicoot are important as well. And you don't see how that's contradictory at all. Do you think Nintendo fans wouldn't love a new Crash Bandicoot and Spyro game? I mean, come on, you just said that they were family driven and these are family driven games. So what are you doing here? Either way, we'll see what happens with all this, but the bigger focus continues to be on these regulators, I'd say. Now, we also got an update for Zelda Tears of the Kingdom that's really, I'd say, just a good sign for its release date, if anything else. And that said, it's been rated by ESRB. You can actually see its rating on the eShop and everything, where it has received an E10 Plus rating, which... I mean, that's no surprise whatsoever. I don't think anybody was expecting anything other than that. But this is interesting in the aspect that a lot of times when we see these ratings, a release usually follows shortly after. So while this isn't necessarily confirmation per se, I, I think what it is, is a good sign that it's not going to get delayed yet again. It appears that May 12th release date is relatively set in stone for at least the time being. So with all that in mind, what I think is going to happen here, I'm just going to go and pull out my crystal ball. What I believe is that next month in January, we will start to hear rumors that an incoming Nintendo Direct is coming soon. Maybe February or sometime like that. But I think insiders are going to come out and make some claims. There's going to be some claims of a Nintendo Direct, maybe a Zelda Direct. Of course, those yearly Metroid rumors and Zelda Wind Waker and Twilight Princess HD rumors might arise as well. But I would expect some leaks to happen next month. Hopefully some of those rumors actually turn out to be true. I would I would love to see a Metroid Prime remake. Cross my fingers for that. But we should get some type of event one way or the other relatively soon. Really we still haven't seen much on Tears of the Kingdom and I mean this game is less than six months away. This will absolutely be their biggest game next year so I'd fully expect a big blowout sometime here soon. Let's go take a look at the poll of the day, though, where I asked you all, would you like a new Conquer game developed by the High on Life studio, Squanch Games? This is something that I have seen several people bring up by this point, so I wanted your all's opinion on this, and yes, the overwhelming majority of you all did say yes. 77% of you all voted yes, while only 15% of you voted no. And you know what? I want to go ahead and say yes as well, and the reason I say that is because if Rare won't do it, well, Squash Games, I mean, they have proven to be a good comedic studio. Actually, with Trover Saves Universe, for that matter, that was an actual good platformer. So I think that they would be at the top of my list for a new Conquer game. I mean, sure, the humor would need to be a little bit different than what's in High on Life. But again, I think that they would be at the top of my list for a new Conquer game. I've also seen some other people say Double Fine as well. And, and yeah, okay, I could see them doing a good job. But they've already kind of alluded that they don't really want to. What's really kind of frustrating here, though, is that Microsoft, they actually had a studio last generation that could have made a new Conquer game, being Team Dakota. People often forget about this studio, but they are the, the developer behind Project Spark, and they made an expansion, Conquer's Big Reunion. And you know what? I know a lot of people didn't actually play that expansion because it was, it was linked to Project Spark, but they actually did a good job, and it felt like a sequel. Unfortunately, it was set up as an episodic series and they only ever got to make one episode. But yeah, if Rare isn't willing to make a new Conquer game, find somebody that will. It's always just been so frustrating that Microsoft doesn't utilize Rare's beloved games more. I mean, yes, they are doing a better job at that now. I mean, we've we've seen a new Battletoads game as of recent. They, they did Killer Instinct last generation. Of course, they're working on Perfect Dark now, but I mean... Come on, let's please, please, let's bring back Conquer. That's one of my all-time favorites, personally. And I know many of you all feel much the same way. So, hey, if Squanch Games is on board, yeah, let's make it happen. Anyways, though, that's it for this episode. But if you liked the video, don't forget to bell notification and subscribe button for more content just like this. 
Also, if you'd like to support the channel through Patreon, thank you for making this content possible. Peace out.